and uh, oh, thanks for recording. We can share the recording with those uh, who miss our January mug meeting, but uh, we're really happy to have this time and have some interesting topics to discuss with the group. So we'll, we'll wait on Roger and we'll jump to uh, Christina talking about the ABLE field side. Great, thank you very much, um, Beth. And it's nice hearing you. Happy New Year to everybody, even though it's almost already 30 days old. Um, and I just want to briefly kind of give you an update of what ABLE is doing because I'm involved in the field guide, just so that um, everybody knows what's going on. And maybe even if you have any any resources or information about um, especially the topic that I'm involved in, um, if you can send that through, that would be very perfect. Um, so what is the field guide? And um, Heather, could you maybe uh, mute your mic because I hear quite a bit of typing. <laughs> Thank you. So the, the field guide is uh, the Field Guide to ePortfolios uh, is an initiative by the ABLE Association and it was uh, announced last year at the conference in Boston and essentially it is a bunch of chapters all together around uh, 12 around different topics. So for example, what does it mean to move to an ePortfolio based institutional learning ecology redesigning learning, ePortfolios in support of connected social and reflective pedagogies. Chapter three, authentic learning and teaching. Uh, then also reflective practice and folio thinking, learners in the digital area, ePortfolios and institutional challenges, assessment outcomes, engagement, retention, completion quality, and so on. Uh, then new ways to demonstrate achievements, transition to careers and career development learning analytics and learners, in internationalization and global learners, creative teaching portfolios, and how important is the technology. So these are the 12 topics that we are trying to tackle. And the idea of the field guide is to think of it more as an executive briefing on ePortfolios for the management senior leadership of an institution and in particular, in this case, for higher education administrators. So these are the primary audience. And um, therefore, the idea is to have very succinct and short chapters. We are allowed only three pages for each chapter, so it really is not a lot, um, in which to capture the topic that we are discussing in very short uh, pieces of information essentially, but then still be able to link out to case studies or supporting arguments and also research and other resources. Um, because what um, Abel said was that uh, the that there are heaps of case studies already out there and they that senior management doesn't necessarily want to hear more stories about ePortfolio use, nor just simple descriptions, but they're really more interested in why should they be doing it and how can they also implement it at scale and what is the significance for the institutions adopting ePortfolios in a systemic way and um, how can it also promote them. So I'm part of a team of altogether Altogether, we have five, um, two from the United States, uh, Kelly and uh, Julie, and then two from Australia, Patsy Le and Leanne from Deakin, and um, I'm then from New Zealand. And we are tackling the topic of transition to career and career development. And in there, we kind of do, look, oh, do want to look at a number of things, namely, why do we actually do what we do? Are the employers demanding ePortfolios? Do we need our resumes anymore? Um, how can we tie it in with authentic experiences? How can we translate the voice of the student into a portfolio that can also help them for career development? How does it fit in with assessment as work integrated learning? And then also not just looking at the first steps of career, but also how can it help in career development? And also what does it mean for branding of the university, but also self-branding, self-marketing and promotion? 
and where do graduate attributes fit in? And then how can we also contextualize everything in, um, within the disciplines and the programs? So there's a lot of stuff for just three pages. And we have already gathered uh, a number of ideas and also some existing research. Uh, but what I've found is that, uh, I th at least in, in my opinion, we, I'm still lacking some more, more data in the sense, especially for, res um, for employers, are they demanding it? Um, how is it being perceived? And do, are there already some studies um, out there for, um, looking at student, port student career portfolios and then what they do with them long term? There are a few studies that we've come across, um, but they are already pretty old, especially from 2008. And there was one done from Notre Dame and also AAC, AAC and U in 2013. But these were the only ones that we could come across besides um, one that was also published by the Wall Street Journal on um, employers' perceptions of portfolios, which was, I think, also about two years ago. And so I just wanted to bring up this topic of the e-portfolio, or yeah, field guide to e-portfolios to let you know that something like this is coming in case um, your, um, your institution is kind of looking for some more information or you need some more, uh, some more arguments for continuing with portfolios or for expanding portfolio use. Um, the publication itself, I think, is packed to be published um, towards the end of the year, October or so, I think, if we can get, it, get everything done on time by the end of March. Um, and so that was the first thing to let you know what's happening in the able world. And the second thing was if you have any, any supporting arguments or any resources that you have come across or any literature or surveys in particular in the field of careers and career development, would be fantastic if you could send those my way, because we do not just want to look at the American market, but also kind of look at internationally. And also, if you have particular case studies that you'd like to share, then please do send them through. I've already collected the ones that I'm aware of. I mean, we, we did have our ABLE presentation last year um, around career. And also have the Solon showcase and then know of the PACE portfolio where um, where you wrote in the blog about how a student got his uh, first job through ePortfolio and some of those, and we'll definitely see how we can include them in the resource area that ABLE is setting up, either directly linking to the studies or maybe in some cases even seeing that we can replicate on the website in case um, some institutional sites go away. That was basically it on the topic. Unfortunately, ABLE doesn't yet have um, information that I could find on the website about the ePortfolio, uh, about the field guide, but I'll see that I can write a blog post at least about our topic this weekend, because I do have the approval from all my collaborators that I can use their names as well. So, Christy, you say uh, uh, October is the target date. Is this going to be, um, I mean, it's going to be about 36 pages long. So is this going to be a, a bound volume, a online PDF, or distributed in some other format? Um, as far as I know, it is going to be a, a, a paper publication. Um, I'm not sure how, how electronically or yeah, in which ways it will also be distributed electronically. It will have a companion website because we are, can only write about three pages um, so that additional resources are linked there or case studies are directly put there and things like that. So, um, yeah, Kate Coleman is the uh, one of the, the leaders of the entire field guide, and I haven't really seen any update in terms of publication or so. What I know is that we need to turn in all our stuff by the end of March so that then the editing process and the, the preparation for the actual publication can get started. I do hope that it's also going to be available electronically. 
um, but I'm not sure yet in terms of costs or free or however it is being done. Oh, thanks, Heather, for finding that. I must have overlooked that. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Thanks. So, Keith, I guess while we're still uh, waiting for Roger, um, I could go next in the lineup. Um, do you want to put my slides in there? Yeah, that would be great. Thanks, Heather. No problem. Um, okay, so uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Heather Askelson, and uh, I work at Pace University as an academic technologist. And uh, we've integrated um, ePortfolio into a couple of different programs here at Pace. And most recently, what we've integrated uh, ePortfolio into, it, or what we're trying to, is the iPACE program. And I wanted to just uh, talk a little bit today about what we're doing with iPACE and um, also how we're integrating uh, ePortfolio into the program. So what iPACE is, to give you a little bit of context, is iPACE is an online degree completion program uh, at Pace geared towards increasing career opportunities for students. And recently I've been in talks with the director of the program to integrate Mahara into their curriculum. Um, this is still in the early phases of development, um, but we expect to have a pilot uh, by the spring. And just to give you an idea of what we're doing, we based uh, the work in iPACE off of some of the work that we've done with other programs at PACE, which we've created these template pages. Um, but with the iPACE program, we've made some different strides where we're streamlining um, the strategies for how to get students comfortable with using it. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, later in the presentation. But this is the basic template that I've created within our um, university's ePortfolio system. And it's based around the iPACE program that they have these five skill categories, and the idea is that students would reflect on each of these skills and then upload and document artifacts uh, relevant to each of the skills. So it's leadership, communication, resilience, teamwork, problem solving. And these artifacts can be anything. I mean, they can be um, documents that they've worked on, um, slides from a presentation, um, teamwork, maybe could even be an image uh, and some support, other supporting documents about uh, teamwork that they've done or a project that they've done. And um, the whole idea of this is that they would fill out each of these categories. Um, and here we also have, uh, you know, they would include a bio, maybe a picture of themselves, uh, reflect on some career goals. Uh, this is an example of what a completed page would look like. Um, this isn't actually a real one, but this is kind of what I've used to provide to the program just to see if um, this is what they're looking for and they are interested in this design. And it's, it's just to give um, students another way um, of streamlining how they're using ePortfolio uh, here at PACE. And uh, one of the more interesting things that we've done is we've also created this Dyson iPACE group within ePortfolio. And the interesting thing about that is that we created this portal page which includes within the group a description about what ePortfolio is, but the interesting thing is that we sort of use the technology within ePortfolio uh, to build um, a sort of mini toolkit that is specific to iPACE students. So I developed out these different video tutorials on how to use ePortfolio specifically within the iPACE program. So how to copy the page, how to upload their documents, you know, what they, what's relevant to them. And we've used the features within ePortfolio to create this one page within their group that has all, uh, is a portal for all of these different resources. And one of the things that we're doing where I created these videos is that we have a link here onto, um, our introduction page here, we have a link to spaces in our toolkit that have other tutorials uh, that goes directly to the portfolio section. But I've also created these videos using our um, media space channel. So at Pace, we have a tool called um, Kaltura Media, uh, which allows you to essentially make a YouTube channel for your university that only has content relevant to your university. And I created a channel within it specifically for iPACE that could be shared through that portal page that I showed you before, but also um, it can be sent out directly to our um, to the faculty and to the students at iPACE. So we're hoping uh, to see good things this spring uh, with usage of uh, ePortfolio within this online program. They're kind of like a good marriage because it is a mostly all online program. It's for continuing um, 
uh, education students in most instances. So uh, we're interested to see how ePortfolio um, fits in with this program. And we'll definitely give you, uh, provide you guys an update if we're seeing some really interesting usage with it. Um, if there's any questions about my presentation or anything about ePortfolio at PACE, uh, you can contact uh, Beth Gordon, uh, who I work with, and then also uh, you could contact me if you have a question about this presentation or just anything related to ePortfolio at PACE University. I'm just going to take a second to read some comments in the chat here. Yeah, so, so Ali made the point that, you know, uh, these templates do help to ease out technical learning curves. Um, uh, yeah, and it looks like you're using them in collections. Uh, definitely, that's sort of like the idea behind this is that, you know, we want ePortfolio to be a tool that makes the classroom experience more interesting. And we don't want, you know, students and faculty, you know, wasting time trying to figure out how to use it because it's actually not a very difficult tool to use, but you have to know where you're going. And uh, these tutorials are very specific to, like, how we're using the Mahara application. Uh, so I think that's kind of like our goal. Okay, so is the portfolio used in uh, faculty? Um, so you, are you asking, do we use ePortfolio for like faculty assessment uh, and evaluation like for tenure? Because uh, we definitely do. So um, does that kind of answer your question, Bass? I think by faculty he might mean um, within one school or one um, one department. Oh, okay. So yeah, we are seeing this used across departments. So uh, we have um, the nurse. Uh, our nursing program uses ePortfolio. Um, our English department uh, has made many strides using ePortfolio. Um, uh, iPace is just kind of the latest. Uh, integration that we're using ePortfolio with a specific cohort or a specific program. So yes, we do see usage across uh, other facilities. Yeah, I just this is Beth. I just want to jump in. Thanks so much, Heather. Um, we just thought this what we wanted to share um, this iPace update because. Um, we feel like it's it's becoming more common for schools to have online programs or branches. And a big question there is, you know, how do you create community? How do you, um, uh, how do you assess student learning if you're moving away from traditional test taking? So it seemed like a nice, uh, a nice combination to include an e-portfolio uh, assessment plan in with an online degree program. So hopefully that was interesting to all of you and uh, you know for those of you that are new to MUG we, we just try to highlight different things our schools are each doing with ePortfolio just to just to share ideas and um, looks like Roger joined us Perf that's perfect so if there's no other questions for Heather then we can turn it over to you Roger if you're ready or it needs a little bit to still set up up, then I can also go first. That's fine. Do whatever. So it's all up to you, Roger. Not quite. Okay. Yeah, Christina, if you want to go ahead, that would be great. Thanks again, Heather. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's definitely really interesting to and and great to see how you are at at pace expanding the use of ePortfolios uh, from what you've done initially and now going into more and more faculties using it for pace path and also for tenure and promotion and really. Um, get more into the faculty seeing that that it can be used by so many people. And that I guess is also quite nice nice way to introduce the the next topic that I wanted uh, to just share with you and kind of see what your thoughts are on it. Uh, because the ABLE conference is coming up again this year. Uh, this year not in, at the end of July but in the first week of August actually. And um, the, uh, it's of course the question whether we as Mahara User Group want to do a uh, shared presentation again, propose a panel, 
and if so, on what topic? Because um, now for most of the years, I, I think, of the ABLE conference, we've actually had, had a shared session uh, between several institutions. And usually, we've had some people in the room, but oftentimes also a couple of people um, joining in via video conference or um, yeah, online meetings. And so this year, of course, um, is again the question, shall we try to do something together so that we again um, show representation of how ePortfolios are being used in different institutions, choose a topic, and then talk about that. Um, ABLE is going to take place from the 1st of August until the 4th in Boston. And the call for paper is due by February 15th. So we still have a little bit of time, and I suspect there might even be an extension to it. Usually there has been one, but of course it's better to, to get it in by the deadline. And this year's topic, as you will see from the link that I've just posted in the chat, um, it is Beyond the Box, Liberating Pedagogical Creativity with ePortfolios. But the topics are... Um, in a way, I think fairly similar to what we've seen in the past years in that it allows a very big cross-section of ePortfolio usage to, to present all the way from scholarly research over to teaching and learning with portfolios, then using it for quality assurance and assessment, um, using it again also for career building, digital identity, and implementing ePortfolios, and again, looking at technology. So I just wanted to see if anybody in the Mahara user group is interested in doing something again this year. And uh, Bath, if if uh, I didn't see if you have a mic or not, if if you do want to have a um, the mic, please let us know because we can enable that for you, so you can speak as well. And George, same for you. I didn't know if your your mic worked or if you only have headset today. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pete. Actually, I just turned on microphone right for all participants. So let's just see what people are typing. Oh, Beth, that sounds fantastic. Beth, that sounds fantastic. And there's definitely, I think, like last year, say, the possibility that we have um, maybe a couple of presenters in the room, but then others who join us via webinar. Beth, the, the regional conference uh, sounds very uh, interesting, so do let us know when you hear. And if you want help with the conference by regional partners. Oh, that's great, Keith. Yeah, oh, uh, I, Keith. yeah. If, 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 there's a little bit of an echo, I'm afraid. But um, if we hold the regional conference, it would most likely be our New York City campus. But it would certainly be great for you, Keith, or George, and other colleagues in the area to attend. I'll keep everyone updated. And I guess if you haven't looked into ABLE yet, um, they might, you might still need a little bit of time to think about it. So if, 
if you are interested in kind of brainstorming further, please let me know um, so that we can look into getting a presentation proposal out and then discuss that more online until the until the 15th. And for 2017, then I just have to thank, thank you for letting me know the date already, Beth, because then um, I'll have to see that we don't put Maharahui here in New Zealand at the same time, because what, what we are thinking about this year is that we are going to have um, small regional meetings, kind of like um, after your full day Mahara user group meetings, um, in about three or four regions in New Zealand, and then in 2017 have a national or bigger conference, a conference again. And so we kind of, over the last two years, tended to have those in March and April. And so knowing that we all might have a conference in April, I should definitely make sure not to put ours there at the same time so that um, people don't have to choose. Uh, Keith, yep, good idea. Let me set it up so I can send you the link. Um, so I um, can include the link here in the recording. And so I guess it's um, probably over to you, Roger. Hello, hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yep, all good there. Really apologise for being late. I was doing something with the kids because um, it's uh, 8 o'clock in the evening on a Friday in the UK here. Um, and one's just come back from friends and whatever. I was just tied up with them. So, um, yes, hello. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Roger Emery. I'm based in Southampton on the south coast of the UK. Um, we um, have been using Mahara since about 2009 or so. Um, what I was going to talk about is the Mahara uh, Hui, UK Hui, which was um, in November. Um, we, <laughs> back in the spring of 2015, I sort of mentioned that we might be a plan B if a venue couldn't be found in London. Um, and within about uh, three or four months after that, we were plan A um, and hosting it. So. We hosted um, the Mahara Hui this uh, this year. Um, I don't know if I can get if I've got access to screen sharing. If I stop that screen, and I might be able to share my screen. Um, got uh, host rights. Yeah, that's all right. I'm just uh, just trying to connect this. So I haven't used this computer before, so it's doing all of the uh, plug-in stuff. Any Looks like Roger might have been, there he is. Roger, we can't hear you at the moment in case you're already speaking. Yeah, if he's uh, installing the uh, add-in in, in order to be able to share his screen, he might be uh, detained for a couple of minutes. Hello, can okay. you still hear me? Um, I'm not sure what's going on screen sharing here. My window's gone really small and it's all gone wrong. Um, okay, nothing like bad preparation. <laughs> Let me just um, try pressing this button again and see if it will work. Um, yes, I think I'm getting there. I think I'm getting there. Right. So, um, that was a conference website I've just put up, if you can see that. Um, so um, we had two fantastic keynote speakers. We had um, on first, um, sorry, on the first day we had uh, Christina, who's with us now, um, who took us through all the wonderful new features and roadmap of um, Mahara. I think it was it fifteen ten that had just been released. Um, so that was fantastic. Um, got loads of sort of interest there in the new features and what's coming in sixteen oh four. Um, and on day two, we had um, Sigi Jacob Kun, who's I probably pronounced her name wrong there, who was um, there's a picture of her here somewhere. I've got talking. Um, 
the Mahara Granny, so she'd come from Germany. So um, just to, um, you know, she's told her sort of her life story of, of using, uh, of education and using Mahara. But um, I think um, I, I sort of didn't quite, I ended up chairing most of the sessions um, and didn't quite engage with all the sessions because I was more concerned about timing and stuff. But overall, I think we ended up with about 25 sessions running over the two days. And we did it as a single strand. There was one one session that was broken out into separate rooms, but we ran as a single strand. So some of the feedback was positive from that because you got to see everything that was happening. Um, we, yeah, as I said, about 25, 26 presentations. The middle of day two, we had um, a sort of lightning strike um, session so people could send, sign up, and we had a sort of effectively an hour or something of um, unconference where people could just get up and talk, which I thought that worked fairly well because people were just shouting things out, getting up, talking, presenting, you know, they're just things they brought. Um, of our sort of, uh, of our sort of um, coverage, it was quite an international conference because there was obviously Christina from New Zealand, we had people from Japan, um, Sigi from Germany, people from Sweden, Denmark, Ireland, Switzerland and all over the UK. So. It was quite an international um, conference for a UK conference, as it turned out. Um, I think I'll just put this other picture up here. Um, this was uh, my personal highlight, um, which was um, the Perrin School, which is a secondary school. So in the UK, that's age 11 to 16. Um, it's a standard state school. It's nothing special, not private, not paid or anything. Standard state school. Um, and they've been using Mahara for a few years now, and um, they've got this uh, scheme for the students there, which they become, I think they've called them transition leaders, um, and they were absolutely fantastic. So they, they talk us through how they do this transition leadership, but the really interesting thing from a Mahara perspective is the students there at that school, the pupils at the school, um, record their schoolwork, their reading record, their progress, etc., on Mahara, and they can share that back with their parents, so the parents can see their progress. Um, the other thing that was interesting about these uh, um, these three kids, and the ones that you can see there, if you can see that picture, were, tw were all 12 years old, um, was they as their role of, as transition leaders in the school. Um, and there were other kids as well, they um, also um, provided teacher training sessions. So when they had teacher training days, which in this country um, schools have what are called inset days, which are in-service training days, um, which school closed, all the teachers in, and they have a whole day training session. Um, these were invited, these uh, transition leader students were invited along for an hour session to talk about digital literacy and e-learning and Mahara um, specifically. So it's fantastic that this, um, I think, control, you know, of, of who's in charge of it, this um, was really being well represented there by these um, girls. And um, their teacher was there, you can see in the, at the rostrum, um, who did um, the majority of the presentation, but then they got up to talk about their perspective. And um, I think they got the biggest round of applause over and above the keynotes because they were so confident. Two of them spoke without notes very, very fluently. Um, and then you think, well, these kids are sort of six years off going to university. What the hell are we going to do with them to impress them by the time they get to university? Um, that's a, a, a good question to ask. Um, I think the other, the other things that came out of the conference um, there was, um, I've just got some notes here, which I know left my glasses somewhere and I can't read them. <laughs> um, in my disorganised state I am at the moment. Um, I think was picked up was, was again, this thing, learner control and learning versus studying. You know, there was, um, there was, there was some interesting debates came through with, um, you know, from that, the sort of transition from FE to HE, that's further education, as in uh, 16 to 18, to university, um, you know, 18 plus education, um, and and this control, and I think these these pupils at this school sort of very well represented uh, the new thoughts, I won't quite say new generation, but a progress that's being made in that control over the learner's learning and their learner journey, rather than maybe a previous um, sort of pedagogy of, you know, you are t 
pupils, you will be taught by the teacher, and the teacher is the expert, the sage on the stage, the, how that control is changing, how the teacher is becoming a sort of learning facilitator more. Um, so that was quite interesting, um, I found. And um, I think we um, we also had um, a couple of our own staff um, presented, which was quite interesting. There was um, a social work um, lecturer um, came and spoke, um, and how he was working with very confidential material on Mahara. So um, that was quite interesting because the, it was then this was using Mahara for privacy, whereas a lot of people are using it for publishing and publicizing themselves or their work. This was for privacy, so the social work students could work on real cases, minute their cases, share them with their tutors and assessors, but with nobody else. And it was their case file. Um, and and following on from that, there was a, a presentation by uh, Jay Rowan from um, Birmingham City University, which is in the middle of the UK. And um, she did a very engaging presentation about nursing. And it, it was very, you could, there was a lot of parallels there between social work and um, nursing, but how she was um, launched it, I think something ridiculous like on 3,000 nursing students all in one go, which was quite a brave and um, turned out to be maybe slightly mistaken um, sort of launch, but um, got there in the end. So there was some, there was some really interesting wide range of um, presentations from the very, very techy um, programmy to, you know, um, UK professional standards, which is the sort of higher education lecturers um, professional standards and how they're being involved, you know, using it for that, um, for staff development. There was arts, there was equine, as I said, there was nursing, there was social work. There was such a wide range um, of presentations there. Um, we have got them all videoed. Um, I'm not entirely sure what's happened to them and if they've got published yet, but um, they have been processed and ready for that. So I'm not sure where they went. I didn't get time to check this evening. It's been a bit, a little bit chaotic at work, but um, but yeah, it was, it was an interesting conference. Um, I don't know what's happening next year in the UK. Where it's going to go next? Um, this is the second time we've hosted it. We ho also hosted 2011, but. Um, yeah, I, I felt um, from the bits I saw when I wasn't worrying about where the next speaker was, um, that it, it seemed to flow quite nicely. Um, and we had a quite an enjoyable evening, I think, at the uh, local, um, what's called Sea City Museum, which is uh, mainly about the Titanic, which left from Southampton. So, um, sailed from Southampton, obviously didn't go very far, but um, uh, there was a we had a sort of nice evening in the museum there, so uh, a bit of time to chat and network with people. So um, the, the the one other amazing thing, and, and I have to um, credit Catalyst, which um, uh, Christina, who Christina works for, um, is their guys down in Brighton who did a lot of the back end admin and and work, you know, um, behind the scenes, getting the website ready and so on. And somehow between um, Aaron, Dana, Brighton, and myself, um, it seemed to work, and everybody turned up. And I've never been to a conference like that before. Every single speaker and every single delegate turned up. It was incredible. Um, and we had a few extras sign up on the day that just randomly wandered in from somewhere. Um, so yeah, I felt it was successful, and I think I might end there unless you've got any questions, and saying I don't want to do it again for another four years, because it was the most tiring thing I've ever done, I think. But there you go. Has anyone got any any questions? Let me just stop sharing that screen. Thanks, Roger. I'm, we'll put I'm you down in for four years time then, I think. <laughs> um, in terms of the videos, just a quick update. If you do have if you do have them and they are all processed and, and ready to go, if you put them somewhere online so that I can put them on the YouTube channel or I can also give you permissions to put it up yourself, then um, I can certainly help with that because it would be really fantastic to have them available to everyone since there were so many really, really good presentations at the conference. Um, they were, uh, yeah, I will check back with Rhiannon. Um, she shared them before Christmas with um, Erin, I think. Um, I'm pretty sure she did because she sort of topped and tailed and edited them all up and put them back and shared the links. So I'm not sure what happens, but um, on Monday I'll check with Rhiannon and see what happened there. And, I think it's probably got, yeah, she did her bit and I saw them and she said she chaired them all, but I've, I've not checked up um, since, so I will find them. They definitely are ready, so it's probably only a matter of 
as you say, uploading them or something. Um, yeah, I'm if, not sure. if, you could, if you could ask her to send me the link, that would be fantastic because then I can okay. look into purchasing things. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, okay, I'll do that on Monday, um, Christina. Um, cool, thank you. Um, yes, and uh, I can attest that it was a really great conference, very well organized by by the entire team, both in uh, Brighton and then also uh, Southampton. And um, the it was really great also to to be there in person, uh, to to see the enthusiasm on the on the people's eyes of when they are talking about what they are doing with the portfolios. And the Maharashtra UK conference has been in existence now for a lot of years already, and. It is a really great event if you haven't been there already. I was counting back. I think this was the seventh um, conference, UK conference, I think, but I'm not certain, but I think it was the seventh. Um, I was trying to trying to work that out because um, there was a couple in London and then we were the first sort of regional one, so I think it was the seventh, give or take. Um, yeah, and I, yeah I, I, think I, I was also... I, I just wanted to thank uh, Christina as well, just thank you as well um, for, for staying on the next day and um, spending some time with our developer Sarah and, and stuff. Um, I'm sorry I didn't spend more time with you socially, but it was the wrong time to spend time socially when you've got a conference on your head, you know, that sort of, <laughs> it's so, so busy. But um, yeah, hopefully we can meet again after working together for about five years online. Um, it, yeah. It's quite interesting, it's mad. So um, I think I'm unfortunately. Yeah, it seems like we still have a. It seems like we still have a few minutes left. If anybody else wants to, to provide an update or ask questions or, I don't know, um, have something else to to share. I've got one more thing. Just thinking about the social workers that. Um, the guys that presented at the conference and we've got another set of social work team which work for the Southampton NHS hospital um, and there was we've done an induction yesterday um, with 120 students that are they're taking their the academic side of their qualification is is validated by Southampton Southern University but the um, they're also doing its work-based um, social work so they've got their professional qualification going in parallel. All of those students work out of the local social work um, offices or at the hospital, and they're based at the hospital, um, local hospital. They don't come on campus very much. I think they're on one day a week. And the model we're working with them, and also a lot of their, their teachers in quotes, but they're sort of work-based um, trainers and, and, and assessors, are work-based and not Solent staff. So there are Solent lecturers going in doing the academic side of it. But we're delivering, they're, they're doing all of their portfolio work on Mahara, but the way we're supporting that is that last year we ran a pilot with them and six of the students that were the pilot students are now peer um, support, I think we're calling them, I can't remember exact terms, but they're, they're going to be sort of peer mentors. Um, at the hospital and their places of work. So this, from the support side, which can be quite heavy at certain times of the year, these 120 students will be then going to their peer mentors at their first step, and then the peer mentors communicate with their local um, teachers and representatives at the hospital, who then come back to us um, as a sort of almost like a, 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 a different level, you know, support level chain all the way back to us. Um, they've also got obviously all the online help as well, but that was just launched this week. So we, I think last uh, this week yesterday we saw 120 students for training, and then next week we're doing um, some intensive support training with the peer mentors, and the peer mentors get recognition for their work there as well. So it'll be interesting to see how that turns out, and I'll try and get the course leader to present that at next. Mahara Huey, whenever that is, um, see if I can get him to put a paper in and present that and that whole project over the last two or three years. It's been quite a long time sort of building up to a fully released. There you go, it's a little update from Social Work Land, something we don't do a lot of at Solar, but they seem to be our biggest users of Mahara at the moment. And one other update from Solent. Does anyone want another one? 
Um, see someone else talking. Um, one other update is that um, back in October, the very first week of term, the course leader for our journalism course, which is um, we do traditional journalism, sports journalism, and um, what's the other one we do? Multimedia journalism, sort of online journalism. Um, came to us with a problem they were having with how they published their stories and how they took their assignments in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they've been using WordPress a lot, but kept crashing it because there was 400 students all uploading to WordPress at the same time, on the same page. There's all sorts of problems. And a very panicked tutor came in and said, "Help! You guys have got to solve this problem. This is official assessment. It has to work. We've got the first thing next week." And what they have is these news days where effectively they work as a news team like you would in a normal newspaper office or television station or somewhere. Um, all the students have got the day and in the morning they've got to go out and get the story. You've got to be a new story for that day. And then they've got to write it up, get the interviews, photographs, whatever other artifacts that go with it. Um, write up the story and then publish that to their sub-editors and then the sub-editors then take the best of those stories and publish them publicly for the end of the news day. So it's like working through a normal, you know, um, scenario, work-based scenario type thing. Um, so we scratched our heads, thought about Mahara, um, and in the space of a few hours had turned it round to um, all of the students now write their stories um, in Mahara, so they have one. They write one page per story, so they may have three or four stories on the go at a time, and then decide which one they want to submit for the sub editors. So they put one page per story in Mahara that includes um, the any video, um, sorry, images they've got, and audio. Due to size, they put the video up on Vimeo and embed that using the Embedly plugin. Um, and then the, then they share that with the, whoever the sub-editor team is, nominated sub-editors for that week. The sub-editor is going to obviously access it, and we discovered, which is quite nice, that you can copy and paste out of a page um, in Mahara straight into WordPress, and it puts everything across, and WordPress doesn't mind the formatting, and it's quite happy with it, and it all looks really nice. So it takes the minimal amount of tidying up once it's into WordPress for public consumption in their templated sort of WordPress page. Um, the other offshoot of that is the students also have to submit six stories for part of their assessment. So the next part of it is they copy the page that they're going to be with their assessment. They have to top and tail it with a few other things related to the assessment and a little write-up. And then because we've now got the Moodle Mahara plugin working properly, um, a Mahoodle assignment that was um, recently re-released, I think, last year, um, they can then submit that directly into Moodle VLE as their assignment. And that was that week we planned it all, worked out how it's going to work, etc., tested it. The following week, um, it was the start of term and we're obviously really busy. We, um, between us, between the team, we divvied it up and we trained 400 journalism students in the space of a week of how to use Mahara for this specific process. So they didn't get a whole how to work the whole of Mahara they got you know this is how to write your story this is how to put an image in put some text in how to share it how to um, upload it you know uh, uh, as an assignment um, and other than a few little teething problems um, mostly with the students that didn't bother turning up as, as always the case um, they've run that for the whole term and it's been absolutely perfect and nothing's gone wrong which is fantastic so there's another little story to uh, to give you of Mahara saves. Oh, sorry. Mahara saves the day unexpectedly, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it was hard work. But again, we um, we got there. There you go. I'll shut up now. A um, couple of questions there. So um, Beth saying about edgy blogs, which is basically WordPress underneath, if I'm correct. And and Ali there talking about WordPress. Um, what we found is a standard standard laid out page, um, and we use something not 
far away from the standard theme. We've got a few other things that look different, but the basics of what you see in the blocks and that are standard um, uh, Nahara sort of theme. Um, if you take the whole lot and copy and paste it into a WordPress editor, it just goes in and it works and it looks fine. We've not worked out a way to link yet um, between WordPress and Mahara. Um, that was it, it was it was too short notice to come up with that answer, but we couldn't find a, an instant um, an instant answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, um, in terms of the link, what uh, depending on which way you want to link, you can do that with RSS feed. So if you put, if you make or if you put a Mahara journal into a Mahara page and make that page public, uh, the journal does get an RSS feed, so you can use that elsewhere. Or your WordPress blogs also have an RSS feed, so you can. Um, use the RSS blog in a Mahara page in order to bring those journals in and also have them available there. If you don't really want to copy and paste all the time, but just want to have uh, a representation of what students are working on in their journals, if they are supposed to reflect there and use Edu blogs or standard WordPress for that and do all the other work in Mahara. And now with Mahara 15.10, we also have, uh, thanks to the Fen Universität in Hagen in Germany, we, we have uh, group journals, site journals, and also institution journals. So that can also be quite interesting um, for journalism um, assignments or for any other group reflection things. And those can, of course, also have a public RSS feed. Thanks, everyone. This was really interesting today, as always. It's always a pleasure to meet with you. And um, I think we're almost out of time. And I want to thank Keith again for hosting us and then sharing the recording. And uh, we'll plan another meeting, I guess, in the next quarter. We've been meeting about four times a year. And in the meantime, if we could follow up with Christina on able presentation topics, even if folks can't attend, we could certainly help to generate some ideas uh, for whoever might be able to attend or participate virtually. Anyone else want to add any closing comments? And thank you to you, Beth, and Heather for organizing the music group meeting again. Our, our pleasure. That's OK, Roger. We, we, I, I feel for you just having to take time out of your evening with the kids. So uh, thank your kids for uh, being willing to part with you for a bit so you could join us. OK, well, that's it. We'll, we'll stop for now. I hope everyone has a great weekend. Nice chatting with all of you. Thank you, and have a nice weekend, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. Great to hear you all again. I'll watch back the recording and see the, the bit I missed um, later. Thank you.